Welcome to Killermont Church. Wherever you are and whenever you are watching, we are glad that you are with us, sharing in this online version of our worship for Sunday, 15th November 2020. Many, perhaps most of us, enjoy a good party. At our 9.30 service this morning, we asked our children to imagine turning up at a party, walking into the room, and discovering that it's packed with all the worst villains they can imagine. And we showed them a montage of Disney baddies, which I hope wasn't too scary for them. But what about you? Try to imagine, if it's not too painful, turning up at a gathering, a party where the worst people you can imagine are guests. And the host, well he's one of the most dastardly and black-hearted people you can think of. And he's welcoming everyone in, the badder the better, and plying them with the best that he has to offer. What kind of celebration is this? What kind of ungodly wickedness are they so thrilled about? Go on, let your mind's eye roam over that room, but not for too long, otherwise you'll be billing me for therapy. And in the midst of that room is someone, well, someone you just never expected to see in such terrible company. Someone who is so good and full of love and truth and well that's his reputation and and there he is right in the thick of things talking and listening and laughing eating drinking the most unlikely guest at this shady shindig so you have a choice in your mind in your imagination which of course is where all choices are made you can either step into the room and start engaging talking listening laughing eating drinking and perhaps asking that most unlikely guest why he's there. Or just watching and learning what he's about. Or you can purse your lips, turn on your heel and leave. Joining the disapproving neighbours gossiping, standing gossiping on the other side of the street. But if you do that, you'll be missing out on meeting Jesus. You'll be walking away from the Son of God. You'll never know why our Lord and Saviour willingly accepted an invitation to party with ne'er-do-wells, good-for-nothing scoundrels, rascals and rogues. Luke, the Gospel writer, tells the story of Jesus going to a party thrown by a man called Levi. Now Levi had a terrible reputation for being dishonest and deceitful and disloyal and he gathered round him other guests who were equally disreputable. While Jesus was inside at the party, the good people, the people who were honest and honourable and high-minded, well they were outside, outside being offended. And they demanded to know from Jesus, from Jesus' disciples, What's he, what's he doing and eating and drinking with crooks and sinners? But Jesus himself answered them. I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. And the invitation is to a changed life, changed inside and out. I suspect that most of us uh, would have left such a party in high dudgeon, indignant and probably relieved to escape. I know I would. And that's why Luke included the story in his gospel. The party he wrote about was real, a real party with real reprobates and rapscallions. Jesus did really party with the worst and he did so knowingly and willingly and with purpose. But as we read about Jesus, we can't help reading ourselves into that story, can we? It demands that we make our own choices. Who do we believe Jesus to be? For whom did he come? Will we follow him wherever he goes? 
with our children this morning, we agreed that Luke's account tells us clearly that Jesus never gives up on anyone, and neither should we. And we should never write off ourselves either. Whatever's going on in our lives, however hectic or noisy or frenetic or chaotic, Jesus always wants to be right in there in the midst. And whatever mess we make, bad decisions, wrong choices, mistakes and moral failures, he never turns away from us when we turn to him. But why? That's the question, isn't it? Why does Jesus care when we couldn't care less? What good does he see in us when we are at our worst? Or perhaps that's not your question. Maybe your question is this, what is Jesus doing eating and drinking with crooks and sinners? How dare he? Let's pray together. Almighty God, you gave us lives to be lived in rich, rewarding relationship with you. How sad you must be to see us sitting in our own little tax collector's booths, whatever they may be for each one of us. And how wrong, when, how wrong we are when we condemn others and, and enjoy doing so. And how completely mistaken we are when we think that we don't need Jesus to come into our lives to forgive us. So, Lord God, we do pray, forgive us. Forgive us, because we want to follow Jesus. And yet we're afraid where he might lead, and that we'll have to leave everything behind. By your Spirit, open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord God, to all that is shoddy and shabby in our lives. The habits, the thoughts, the temptations that we just settle for, the ways of living which we've convinced ourselves, well, are the best we can do. And show us instead the joy and satisfaction, the celebrations which Jesus is truly offering. Lord God, we need Jesus. No one and nothing else can heal us or anyone else. And now we pray as he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from our time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our first song this morning is this, I Surrender All to Jesus. It's an old song to an old tune, but rediscovered by a new generation. I Surrender All to Jesus, sung by Robin Mark. And if you're watching through our website, kpc.church, or on YouTube, please click on the banner which will appear on your screen so that you can hear this song. And if you're on Facebook, please pause this video and click on the link in the accompanying post. This morning's reading comes from Luke 5, verses 27 to 39. In this chapter, just when the Pharisees thought they had worked out who God is and what he wants, Jesus arrived. The Pharisees had been trying really hard to do the right things. They studied and they struggled and they spent most of their lives avoiding people and places and things which might contaminate them and offend God. In fact, the Pharisees were so afraid of offending God that they kept themselves apart from almost everyone else. And they certainly wanted nothing to do with anyone who clearly wasn't living as God wanted. So when they saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and others who lived outside the boundaries of respectable society, they were outraged. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi 
sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as a guest of honour. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Amen. Every year I pay £200 for the dubious privilege of remaining on the roll of the Faculty of Advocates as a non-practicing member. And every year I wonder why. But this is one of the reasons. You see, I'm still technically a member of the legal profession and that allows me, gives me carte blanche to tell rude jokes about lawyers. And here's my current favourite. A lawyer is pretty ill and he needs serious, serious surgery. And he goes into hospital and he has his operation. And as he's waking up from the anaesthetic, he asks, Nurse, nurse, why are all the blinds drawn in here? And the nurse answers, <laughs> There's a fire across the street and we didn't want you to think that the operation had been a failure. <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> and everyone loves a good lawyer joke, I guess, and jokes about bankers, estate agents and politicians, a few of whom we could name. And that's because, I guess, as, a, as groups, they're just not well liked and probably unfairly. In New Testament times, there was a group that were proverbial for their unpopularity, tax collectors. They'd effectively bought the right to collect taxes on behalf of the occupying Roman Empire. So they were doing the Roman Empire's dirty work in the places where it hurt the people most, in, in their purses. That is if they had a purse or indeed money to put in it, because most people were pretty poor. Uh, and paying even a few drachma in taxes was painful. And there were so many things for which taxes could be demanded. And so a Jewish man like Levi, who was probably taxing people for coming and going along one of the great imperial roads, well, he'd have been particularly despised. He, he had almost unfettered scope for scamming and fleecing and inflating the tolls, levying taxes, uh, uh, which he had the right to collect, but often at a, an inflated rate, because that's how he made his money. And he was doing so on behalf of the oppressing and pagan Romans. He was almost as feared and ostracized as the leper whom we met last week. And he was regarded as unclean and unworthy before God, and certainly not someone uh, with whom a good religious teacher should be socializing. So it would be easy to brand Levi as a traitorous, idolatrous thief who preyed upon his own people and exploited the poor. End of story. He's beyond redemption, past praying for, deserving everything that's coming his way. And yet, Levi met Jesus. He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus asking him to become one of his followers, and Levi agreed. Okay, it seems unlikely, but, but possible, because Levi wouldn't be the first person to think, oh, this Jesus is a good guy, he's a good man, he's a wise teacher, and an interesting character, and I'm, and I'm interested, I've got nothing to lose by finding out more, I can find a few hours and risk a few drachma for this Jesus, that's no problem. That's a very common reaction to Jesus thus far, and no further, don't come too close, Jesus, no thanks. But Levi met Jesus, saw Jesus, heard Jesus, and got up and left his tax collector's booth. Uh, no booth, no tax collecting. So Levi is giving up on a lot more than a few hours of his time and a few drachma. He's leaving behind his old life, his lucrative livelihood. 
He's stepping into a new way of living. In fact, Levi has become a disciple of Jesus. Now, there's lots of ways, good ways, of understanding what it means to be a disciple and what that meant for Levi. But here's one one way that I think is particularly helpful in relation to this story. Discipleship is a journey, a lifelong journey in which we learn to live the life that Jesus offers. As we've often said here in Killermint, that means becoming Jesus' best version of ourselves. And of course, discipleship involves, involves movement, physically, getting up and getting away from things that are not God's plan for us. And clearly, Levi knew that ripping off his own people at the behest of the Romans was not God's plan for him. Uh, but there's also the mental, emotional, spiritual aspects as well. It's all about moving away, moving on, moving beyond, moving past, and moving towards towards Jesus. Levi could not remain a tax collector and also follow Jesus, not in any meaningful way. Levi had to embark upon the lifelong journey in which he would learn to live the life that Jesus was offering to him. And so Levi, the traitorous, idolatrous thief who preyed upon his own people and exploited the poor, well, he'd become a follower of Jesus, a disciple one of the first. But there's more, and this really excites me. Levi the pariah discovers that God wants him to be Levi the evangelist, a spreader of the good news of the kingdom of God. You see, it's the reality of the kingdom of God that Jesus has been preaching and demonstrating and modeling, and, and that's the message that Levi heard and witnessed in Jesus. And it was the gospel that drew him to where he was. He was awakened to sin. The realization, or perhaps the confirmation, That he, Levi, is separated from God. Uh, Levi had chosen to leave God behind and there was simply no way back for him. He was lost to God. His situation was one of despair and Levi knew that. He had awoken to the reality of his sin. But then there was the awakening of hope. Discovering that, after all, God had not written him off. God's love for Levi had not dimmed. God still deeply desired to reclaim Levi as his son. And then there was the awakening of possibility. Levi realizes that God has cleared the way back for him, Levi, to God. And God will give Levi all that Levi needs to be restored to his heavenly Father. The way is clear and the way is Jesus. Follow Jesus, Levi. Follow Jesus. And then there's the awakening of joy because that's what Levi does. He follows Jesus. He follows Jesus with everything that he is because he's left behind everything that he was. And that's what what the celebration is all about. That's what the party is for. Jesus is Levi's saviour and Levi cannot contain his joy. His excitement just has to be shared. And the good news is not only for Levi but for every tax collector, every sinner. Meet Levi the evangelist. And 2,000 years later, Through the pages of the Bible, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32, Levi is evangelizing us, you and me. But how can this be? We're not tax collectors, are we? We're we're not scum. We're not even sure that we're sinners. Not not really, not bad sinners. Well, in that case, why are you here? If you are not a sinner, then Jesus did not need to be born for you, to live for you, to die for you. He need not have bothered. For you, at least, well, he was just wasting his time. Remember what Jesus said. Healthy people don't need a doctor. 
sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Contrast those who know that they are sinners and need to repent with those who think they are righteous. Contrast the joy, exuberance, generosity of Levi, of Levi, bringing Jesus to his home as his guest of honor, to meet his friends, to share his story, to spread the gospel. Contrast that Levi with the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law who complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with this scum? My friends, what greater sin can there be than to turn to Jesus and to say to him, Jesus, I don't need you. Oh, and Jesus, they, those of whom I don't approve, they don't deserve you. Now that is rebellion against God. That is what sin looks like. Surely better by far to be a repentant tax collector than a stiff-necked Pharisee. What do you think? So how will your encounter with Levi and with Jesus change you? How will it inform who you pray for? Whom are you going to permit yourself to wish well, the best, to reach out to? Which appalling person? I see that in adverted commas, who just does not deserve to be loved by God. Are you going to invite into your friendship, your home, your life, so that they can meet Jesus? And when Jesus calls you from your own tax collector's booth, will you follow? Will you give up everything and begin or resume your lifelong journey in which you learn to live the life that Jesus offers? Amen. And to God alone be the glory. And now Morvan will lead us in our prayers for others. Let's pray together. Lord God, we know that you never turn away anyone who is turning towards you. We know this because we know Jesus. Father, we condemn others often because they are different. We turn our dislikes into damnation. We write people off. We keep away because we want to keep safe. We give up on men and women and children far too easily. Father, forgive us. Holy Spirit, turn us into followers of Jesus who are leaving bitterness and complaint and self-righteousness behind, but who never forget that Jesus died for us and for all of humanity. God of love, we pray for our brothers and sisters both here and all around the earth. Show us our place in this world as channels of your love for everyone no matter their race, colour, nationality or religion, for not one of them is lost from your sight. Help us as Christians to let your love and compassion shine out through us and help us to protect all life and prepare for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace and beauty. Father, you hear the cries of all who are in trouble or distress in our world today. Accept our prayers for those affected by war, famine, poverty, illness and fear. And help us always to show both compassion and kindness where we can, however simply. We pray for the leaders in our world. Please grant them wisdom and fairness so that they may make decisions and use their power wisely. We also again pray for all those involved, particularly just now, in battling the coronavirus. In particular, our country's leaders, our doctors and nurses caring for those who are ill, and for those who are creating and testing the vaccine which may help to combat the virus, 
and help us return to some greater level of normality. Bless them, Father, and give them strength when they are weary in this ongoing fight. Please bless our families, our neighbours, and all in our local community of Killament with your love and protect us from harm. Grant us grace to forgive, the strength to overcome any difficulties and challenges which we face personally, and to look out for others, appreciating that they may be fighting battles of their own that we know nothing about. We pray that you help us to be kind, forgiving and without judgment, turning our hearts to your ways and giving us peace. In your name, we ask for your blessing upon us all. Amen. We close our worship by listening to the great hymn, Lift High the Cross. It's all about the joy of following Jesus, our crucified and risen Saviour, and proclaiming his love till all the world adore his sacred name. And now let us go into the coming days, alert to the call of Jesus, eager to introduce him to all whom we meet. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon us and all whom we love, and upon our nation and our church, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>